Sixty percent of the of homes in the UK are owned outright without a mortgage. So it's actually a minority of homeowners that have a mortgage now. And even amongst those people that do have a mortgage, I think the average loan to value ratio is forty percent. We're obviously starting to see in some of the data that's come out recently the current level of mortgage rates really weighing on the market. And unfortunately, we think that's probably going to continue for the next nine months or so. Hi, I'm Andrew Wishart, and I run the UK housing service at Capital Economics. From Ackroyd Lowry, I'm Oliver Lowry, and I'm John Ackroyd. And this is Urban Forecast, the show where we talk to the people defining the future of our cities. We discuss their background, what drives them, and the insights they've learned along the way. This is a podcast for anyone who's interested in how we live, work or play in the cities of the future, and what that means for the built environment today. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's really nice to see you again. I'd like to start, usually I start by asking people their journey into the industry that they're in but what I'd like to I'd like to flip this one on its head and I'd like to ask you the state of the economy at the moment how did we get to this point that we're in at the moment absolutely so I think really obviously you have to trace back where we are now to to the pandemic and in that period where we saw you know what people could spend money on severely restricted at the same time as sort of unprecedented government intervention in terms of both you know households being given funds to tide them over but also interest rates falling from already low levels to to zero levels and i think you know those two things together at the same time as you know a big shift in in working patterns has led to the sort of the quite extraordinary performance of of the economy and the housing market over the past couple of years so because of that kind of environment where households have quite a lot of cash on hand and borrowing is cheap you know i think both economic activity as people have been able to go out and spend again has been pretty strong. The labour market, you know, in terms of jobs, is, you know, there's been a real sh- firms have had real difficulty getting the people they need in order to, to respond to that kind of that demand, and that's I think what's led to the sort of inflation the Bank of England is really worried about. And at the same time, you've got these global factors such as the war in re- Ukraine, meaning we've got we're importing inflation as well. Energy prices obviously going up a lot, so you know you've got basically inflation from everywhere, and that's that's a step change from, you know, the, the decades before where we've seen, you know, countries joining the global trading system, meaning there's, you know, an ample supply of goods, services, energy, food. And so it really does feel like a bit of a turning point. And obviously it's given us sort of a, a return of inflation. And so is so is that, do you think a kind of deglobalization is, is part of the reason that we are, as you say, importing inflation? I think that's definitely a longer term trend, I suppose. A lot of the inflation we've had over the past couple of years is partly realizing how kind of you know fragile a, a very globalized world can actually be when you have these these shocks and you know you have sudden sudden restrictions in in you know natural gas for instance and and things like that. So I think that is going to mean that we get more deglobalized and that sort of deglobalization, the sort of what we, we call it fracturing, particularly between sort of the US led world and the China led world, you know, means that the kind of downward pressure on inflation we've had for a long time isn't going to be be that be there anymore. So I think kind of bouts of inflation are likely like we, like what we've seen are probably going to become a bit more bit more common after an exceptional period where we just had no inflation really for 20 years or so and i just want to this is obviously a show about the future of cities so talking pure economics i know that your role is is quite focused on property would you like to just explain you know with that in mind we we are where we are now these things have happened what has been the impact so far on the property market so i think there's been i mean it's kind of a little bit difficult to 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 translate what what's going to last and what's not from but certainly what we've seen is obviously a big shift towards working from home a big sudden change in people's preferences of where they want to live because suddenly you know a they want more space so they can live further because they can live further away from the office and it's actually cheaper to to get that space further out so you end up with this big reassessment of of where people want to live and i think you know that's meant that even though we've had mortgage rates rising up until now, we've still seen really pretty strong levels of how of housing sales as people adjust to that. So I think the big question is really sort of how much longer does that go on for and keep supporting the market? But I think some of the more recent data suggests that maybe that kind of race-based trend is coming to an end because we've, for instance, started to see 
you know, larger homes were massively outperforming flats. You know, they rose by sort of a, a quarter in price, flats by five, 10 percent between the beginning of the pandemic and sort of the beginning of this year, whereas both now more or less stagnating or falling a bit. So that kind of difference in how different types of homes are performing has ended. So maybe this kind of maybe that that shift has already has already happened. And do you not see some of the political sort of decision making, for instance, the decision to tax or stop the ability to write off mortgage payments against rental assets as as having driven quite a, you know there's been a, a significant impact due to the, the sort of pressures on on landlords has that you know at the sort of macro scale that you look at does that register yeah definitely so i think these with these policy questions i think often maybe the government doesn't fully anticipate the scale of the consequences so when you brought in when we saw buy to let mortgages get quite popular in the, in the 90s and some of those you know and 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 property as an investment really becoming popular and and the taxation almost to some extent helping to facilitate that you know that that has led to a huge shift of homes out of the from you know owner occupiers to buy to let landlords and I, I think perhaps and that that I think was you know at the time that was basically to try was done in part to try and help put a floor in under the property market after the financial crisis but I think it's also led to landlords being able to sort of outbid some people who would have instead bought rather than rented. And there has been a big drop in the kind of youth or youth home ownership rate over the same period that we've seen this shift. So I think the government now is probably trying to go the other way with, you know, the higher rate on additional dwellings, preventing people from expensing uh, mortgage payments on buy to let properties. I think those, those things are going to, are basically trying to, you know, home ownership is all the government has always said is it's kind of, is one of its policy objectives. So I think that, they're starting to address that. that, but it doesn't seem to back that up with policies that that make much sense in terms of delivering that. Yeah, I think that's that that can be true on the sort of construction side, but I think over time we're forecasting quite a lot of sales of private rented property because the business model doesn't make sense as much in a higher mortgage rate environment, and yields are already were already relatively slim by historical standards coming into this. So the kind of returns aren't really going to be there anymore potentially. So you know, I think that will mean that there's there is a bit of a shift back and maybe we see the rental the size of the private rental market shrink a bit and as, as more people can get on the private uh, on the housing ladder but right now obviously it just feels like buying is expensive and renting is expensive and there's no immediate solutions so yeah it's a kind of it's a, the, the transition to that is 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 pretty miserable for everyone i think and i think uh, it's a good good time to to bring in every time i ask you a question about things that are historical you tend to want to talk about things that are going to happen in the future. So it'd be a good moment just to introduce the company that you work for, talk about a little bit about what they do, and then also about your role within that. Yeah, absolutely. So I work for Capital Economics, which is basically a, 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 a macroeconomic forecasting company. So we had about sort of 80 economists spread across North America, Asia, and, and most in London. And we forecast most of the major economies and emerging markets in the world. But we also We've got sort of financial markets, commodities, and where I work, property forecasts. So the UK and US housing markets, and then commercial property in, in Europe and the US as well. And I suppose, yeah, really what's different about us from a lot of other kind of property commentators is that we're always kind of focusing on that that next three years, which is perhaps why I always want to, to talk about that, but kind of taking our economic forecasts and seeing, translating that into what it means for, for property markets. So that's how I spend my time. And the other thing that, that that stands you out at the moment from others is that you you called this one right. So I think yeah. you've, been, you've been featured recently on quite a lot of publications, Sky News, BBC, some of the broadsheet papers, quoting you because, and it might be worth just discussing, you know, what it was that you predicted and, and how that came to pass. Yeah, so I think our focus on what's going on in the economy, you know, a lot of these things, particularly interest rates and what's happening with employment have a pretty reliable guides to what's going to happen with the housing market so yeah i think in general you know we've always we're kind of one of the first people to predict like a material fall in house prices and that was before the mini budget made it kind of a no brainer but then i think we you know we were admittedly sort of a bit surprised by you know the dip in mortgage rates at the, in, at the beginning of this year being enough to sort of stabilize the market 
whereas things still looked incredibly expensive at the cost of buying by historical standards. But yeah, I think, you know, our, we, we, and it's thanks to our economics team, really, that we've always expected interest rates to rise a bit further than, than most people. And obviously that fed through to a, a higher, higher mortgage rate forecast. So, and that's basically now we're, we're seeing that happen. And that's why, you know, it tra- uh, mortgage approvals are falling again, prices are falling again. But fortunately for us, because of that, uh, those economic forecasts, we've been kind of been expecting that for about, uh, we've had that in for this year for about nine months, so a bit longer than most other people. I went to a round table, it must have been maybe the spring, and I remember leaving very upset because you predicted all these things that I didn't really feel like were were the things that the market was predicting. They were much worse. And then I think, actually, a lot of those things happened, but some of them didn't. And that possibly is a, is a, a moment to query, you know, what, what supported the economy not going into recession, which I do think that you had predicted. Yeah, so this, this recession we had forecast, we've had kept having to push back, and we are still expecting it. But basically, I think there's a couple of things. And I think the housing market is at the core of it. So, you know, we, we've basically seen up until now, sort of, uh, housing sales and construction which both, you know, have a lot of activity linked to them, obviously construction directly, but then when you buy a house, things like furniture, estate agents and solicitor fees, things like that, basically holding up better than we anticipated as some of these kind of one-off factors from people wanting to move due to the pandemic continuing to come through. And then the other one is that, you know, the mortgage market has changed a lot since we last had interest rates up at where they are now. And, you know, it basically the kind of, the increase in people's mortgage costs that they're seeing is only coming through extremely gradually. So the average rate on all mortgages is still below 3% because a lot of people on a five-year fix could even sit out this kind of rise in interest rates completely and, and be quite happily on 2, two, two percent throughout, which would be a very pleasant place to be. But then there's others who obviously, you know, are, are going to be taking taking a bigger hit almost to offset the fact that some people won't won't feel it at all. But taken all together that basically means that that kind of rise in interest rates that is designed to slow the economy down it's been happening much more gradually than it would have done in the past i'm desperate to ask questions about what you think is happening next but i do just before we do that want to ask how did you end up in this role what was your background i didn't really know what i wanted i thought i wanted to be an engineer because my dad was an engineer but then i had a brilliant economics teacher at a, uh, when i did my a level so that just led to me doing economics at university and while i was there we had a university is really keen on doing sandwich years working so i managed to get a get a placement with the hm treasury for a year working on gdp and inflation in their sort of economic analysis department and then i knew that sort of yeah being an economist was what i wanted to do and i've actually you know after graduating i applied for the capital economics grad scheme and i've been there ever since so eight years now and a bit part of the furniture but um for most of that time i was covering the uk economy which is really handy because I can still obviously talk to the UK team and about about what they're thinking and then sort of since I think it was November 2020 I moved over to the the housing role came up and the sort of opportunity to to run my own shop in that department so um yeah that's that's kind of the backstory nice right okay now carte blanche we're allowed to talk about property and what's going to happen next because I know that's what you really want to talk about so <laughs> Are our interest rates going to go up further or have we peaked? So I think we think that the, you know, the the bank bank rate will probably go up once more. But I think in terms of, you know, in terms of what happened, what matters for for property, I think it's really all about what people are expecting further ahead. So that won't necessarily check, move the dial on on longer term interest rates. So, yeah, what we're expecting is that mortgage rates are going to stay around their current levels of sort of five and a half to six percent for the next year, because we do think that you know interest rates are going to have to be kept quite high in order to sort of to, to bring inflation down and keep it down. And yeah, I think that's I think that's probably longer than most people expected. I think in general, after these spikes in mortgage rates, people really thought that they'd come down quite quickly. But the big reason for that is is well, it's twofold really. So firstly. Just the pace at which interest rates have risen, uh, lenders weren't really prepared for. So they're still kind of their margin, their margin in terms of mortgage rates above what the kind of market interest rate is over a two or five year period is still pretty narrow. So they're going to want to rebuild that to 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 increase their or improve their profitability back to where it was. And then the other thing is that you know people don't tend to foresee 
interest rate cuts much before they happen historically. So it's very likely that kind of the two and five year interest rates that are critical for setting mortgage rates, fixed mortgage rates, are probably going to stay around, you know, that that kind of their current level until we get to that point, which we think sort of next summer. So, you know, until then, we don't really see a much scope for a big drop in mortgage rates. So and that means, you know, the, we're obviously starting to see in some of the data to come out recently, the current level of mortgage rates really weighing on the market. And unfortunately, we think that's probably going to continue for the next nine months or so. And I think what we're seeing is that it's not necessarily, well, yes, I mean, the papers said yesterday there's been a 14% drop in, in house prices, I think, or, you know, higher since 2008, possibly. But what I think is more evident is the lack of transaction, because nobody really wants to crystallize their loss unless they absolutely have to. So rather than seeing property prices going down, you're just seeing far fewer transactions happening as people don't want to put their mar- their properties on the market, be it commercial properties, residential properties, and domestic or, you know, sites, really. There's yeah. when, when you're, we work with, you know, property developers looking for sites and they're saying well there's not a lot out there because nobody wants to be the mug unless they really have to who's going to take a a haircut on what they bought it for yeah absolutely i think that yeah i think that you kind of get housing downturns in a sort of mix of ways and like you say you can either have you know if demand weakens you could just have if supply keeps coming you see the big price correction and we've seen that in some places like sweden where they've got kind of they've got variable interest rates so people end up paying the higher cost whether they move or not so they're just like well you know, it doesn't really make much difference to me. If I move, I'm still paying, you know, a higher mortgage rate. And then you've got the opposite in the US, where buying a house is, I think, more expensive than it was even in the financial crisis, if you need a mortgage. But there, because they're all on 30 year fixed rate mortgages, no one wants to move because they'd end up having to pay so much more as a for the on the mortgage because they're blocked in at you know, 2% and currently they have to switch to a 7% mortgage if they bought a new house because I don't think you can really port mortgages there. So there's basically no secondhand homes for sale and they've, yeah, transactions are through the floor, but prices are stable even rising. So there's, a, and I think maybe in the UK, we're sort of, we have, we're kind of in the middle, I think, between those two extremes. And that's probably an interesting point to just discuss on a sort of macro level you know there's lots of sort of headlines about how the the uk economy is performing more poorly than you know european countries is that what you're really seeing because it's often difficult to work out whether the headlines have any backing i I know that germany's struggling you know plenty of countries appear to be struggling how would you rate first of all the uk's economic performance against other countries and then secondly the uk's property economic performance against other countries yeah so we just I mean, we thought that the UK was really lagging behind quite seriously, but then we had some new, all the data got revised because it turns out it's quite difficult to measure and how much an economy is producing when you have these massive shifts in in what people what people can consume during COVID and in and, and the aftermath. So, you know, I think we've seen big revisions that mean the UK is no longer really an outlier. Uh, it, it's actually, the economy is actually performing okay. And that... I guess that kind of the things you can measure, like the jobs market, are still pretty pretty robust. So I guess that makes that makes quite a bit of sense. So I think, to be honest, yeah, in terms of compared to Europe, the economy as a whole performing roughly in line uh, now. In terms of the property market, yeah, I'd say the UK is kind of UK is kind of in the middle from a housing market perspective uh, as well. There's some funny things going on in some places like Spain and France where there's usury laws in place that prevent mortgage lenders raising mortgage rates too quickly so that's kind of slowed down the impact of higher interest rates there but then as well because we've got a a strong jobs market and most people are sort of on a five-year fix as well then I think that's kind of slowing down slowing down the impact but not as much in other places and we are starting to see I think one of the reasons this kind of downturn in the housing market is becoming more apparent is because you know we have seen the rate of sales as you were saying slow down a lot homes are staying on the market for longer Ultimately, that means there's more, just more, in, more inventory or stock on the market any time, and then that's when it really kind of shifts to being more of a, a buyer's market than a seller's market. So, does that finally benefit the first-time buyer? Does that put property in the hands of the people that the government are saying they want the properties to end up in the hands of, or does it in fact lend itself to those properties ending up in the hands of people that have got lots of cash, don't need to borrow any money, and you know can swoop in and buy absolute bargains? Because that seems to be what I'm seeing. Yeah, I think right now, you know, it's pretty horrifically expensive for, 
for for for, for anyone who needs a, a significant mortgage. So, sure, if you if you've got cash as a as a you know growing share of the housing market is owned outright without 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 a mortgage, and you know people sure have what, that how, what, aren't so affected. What, what sort of, do you know what kind of percent what what percentage is owned outright now, and and how much is that increasing by? Do you know? So yeah, sixty percent of the of homes in the UK are owned outright without a mortgage. So it's actually a minority of homeowners that have a mortgage now. And even amongst those people that do have a mortgage, I think the average loan to value ratio is forty percent. So you know, I think that's we've seen a big decline in the, the amount of times me people move house home in their lives over the past forty years or so. And you know, there's people lit, sitting in in the same home for longer paying down the mortgage and, and paying it off in a lot of cases so yeah i think that that helps explain and a lesser reliance on on mortgages to buy homes is definitely a reason why some countries and the uk to to an extent have, have kind of managed to shrug off the interest rate increases so far but then of course you know if you think about a chain the housing market's linked together the first time buyer is probably going to need a mortgage unless they're very fortunate so well, the um, is, it will the, thing is the people pass that, up the chain the people that definitely need to borrow money are p- the people building houses you know the property market cannot be there's very few people that would ever buy a site and then develop that site and not use any debt and it's those people that i think you know the the, the impact is yet to be seen because it's slowing down now and us missing our housing targets that now don't exist anymore anyway you know the the significance of that will not be seen for for years to come i suppose if you're only looking at the three year you you i suppose are forecasting that what there's going to be less development starting are you looking ahead at what that means for the economy you know going forward yeah so i think it has definitely has the it could definitely lead to to issues of undersupply that so I think in general, one fact that basically surprises most people is that the housing stock, the amount of homes we have in the UK has actually grown faster than the population for the majority of the last 40, 50 years. But that wasn't the case in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And we're expecting kind of a similar drop back in house building, or well, not quite as extreme, but we're, we're expecting that again, again now. And, you know, that that was particularly evident in in London, early 2010s, London went through a boom, and that was driven. Prices did, but the drought was driven by population growth massively outpacing supply. And there's definitely a chance of that happening again because obviously we've got we've got pretty high migration in the last year. People tend to move to London, and then at the same time, you know, that's probably where supply is going to be most most restricted in this in this slump in building. So, you know, potentially it can make that problem worse. But I think. Yeah, the kind of housing shortage thing. I think it's true in the southeast in London, but not necessarily in many other places in the UK. So what happens then? We have interest rates going down in about nine months time. The Bank of England. Is that right? What's next after that? Do we get like a, a bounce back effect because property prices start to go up? because of, as you're saying, lack of supply. And then there's a big rush where everybody's desperately trying to build and sites, the value of sites then goes up. Is is that what you're predicting? Yeah, so I think there's kind of two things that basically drive the kind of house prices over the longer term. And that's basically the pay and interest rates and put those two things together and you can get kind of what be roughly a fair value for housing. So the good news is we've had quite strong pay growth over the past couple of years. In fact, house prices increased by the same amount as pay, basically, since the beginning of the pandemic, which is kind of but kind it, of crazy. But, how, <laughs> but if, how does that track against inflation? Is Are they all, you know, is it like 10% on all, on all, all of those? Are all of those going up by the same or is one outpacing the other? So what we've seen is basically pay and the price level, the change in which is inflation have kind of gone up in a pretty, you know, they've accelerated, but they've kind of gone up in a straight line. House prices initially in 2021 were rising even faster than that at kind of a ridiculous pace. So they spiked much higher. But then summer 2022, they started to, they plateaued. And then more recently at the end of last year, and then again now, they've, they've come they've come down. And basically, if you just look at the whole period from sort of 2019, beginning of 2020 until now, prices pay and house prices have all risen by roughly the same amount sort of 20 to 25 percent so that means that this kind of house house price falls we're forecasting have driven fully now by high m- higher mortgage rates than in the past so you know if we get mortgage rates coming back down that should 
allow us certainly in to, to have uh, you know, house prices stop falling in in cash terms, we think by sort of the middle of next year. So we're quite a, a, a way apart from some people calling for a 20 to 30 percent fall in prices. And that's that's mainly because when you take into account the fact that the prices and pay in the wider economy has risen so much, you know, in cash terms, you're never going to have that drop. But if you adjust for that, then, yeah, house prices compared to pay compared to prices are going to be, you know, potentially a quarter lower than they were in 2022. So cash, not in actual... But not in, but not in cash terms. And that, you, I think that will really help sentiment. What do you think it will be in actual cash terms? 10.5% is the, from peak to trough. So nice and precise. But I guess the kind of latest house price data made me wish that maybe we stuck with we stuck with a 12% fall. But I think in that, you know, it's much of a muchness. I think it'll be in that range. And so, yeah, I mean, back to my prediction question, what, you know, what happens then you get, you know, the economy starts to bounce back. Wages are already going up as it is. So that drives back house price growth, which drives back economic development in the property sector. Is that what you're predicting? I think there are some quite significant sort of lags involved potentially and I think it takes a while for sentiment to recover as well as the sort of fundamentals so I think for a serious recovery we're, we're looking probably more like 2025 when that begins so sort of second half of 2024 is kind of a bit flat but then 2025 I think definitely you know the the, the, the cost of buying which has been so stretched for, for several years will really come down and I think that could lead to you know, people who have basically wanted to buy but haven't been able to for for a couple of years coming into the market, I think that will, yeah, we'll definitely see house prices rising again in 2025, I think. And prices, transaction and construction tend to go hand in hand. So we'll probably get construction on the rise as well. Good, good. Need a bit of that. Amazing. Thank you, Andrew. What, what other things are you noticing? And what other, you know, like you have this amazing overview. What other factors are you noticing that you think might have an impact on the property sector? Good question. Change, what about a change of government? You know, what happens next year when Labour come into power? How does, do you, do you guys model for political change or is that sort of too too abstract? I think in general, these changes of government don't really make a massive difference to policy, I don't think. But I think maybe Labour would be potentially be more willing to explore things like making sort of rental housing, the provision of that, they'd be kind of more comfortable with more of that being public sector i suppose so you know i suppose if you really want to move the dial to a large extent on house building if you look back over the over the large long swathe of history it's really when you've had a significant public house building that's when you've really increased the housing stock quickly so you know if potentially that could become part of the agenda the other thing is that does that help or hinder an economy i mean the, we did a, a breakfast recently with brandon lewis where he was saying you know if you want economic growth and he's published a white paper on this as well so i'm, I'm not saying exactly what he said at the breakfast but if you want economic growth you must build houses but is there also the possibility that he is incorrect and if you build lots of housing and you fund that centrally through a central government what you actually do is hinder the property market from being able to deliver that housing and you you end up in a situation where being a developer is not actually as economically viable because you don't have that supply and demand imbalance. Yeah, I think it's a tricky one. I think at the moment we're in a situation where it depends what you want housing to really deliver. Obviously, as well as being an asset, it's got to it's got to fulfill its sort of main function of you know people having somewhere to live and also being able to move around. And I think, you know, obviously outright supply is important, but also I think what we've seen in recent decades, which is part of the reason why maybe you know economies in general have been growing more slowly and particularly the UK is that people really it's quite difficult people don't move houses as much as they used to it's probably more difficult to move around because housing in general is more expensive than it used to be and I think there's sort of I think part of that we're doing some work that is still in the pipeline about you know why do we perceive there to be a housing shortage when so much of the data shows there's actually sort of you know the housing stocks growing faster than the population as I said earlier and we think a large part of that is kind of demographic changes and people living for longer and and staying in in larger houses. And so they've got basically, you know, effectively, if you've got an older couple or, or person on their own living in a large house, they've got a number of bedrooms there that aren't being used as efficiently as they could. So we're kind of building these new houses at the same time as that that sat there. So I think That's in it, other I'm, countries, I'm, they have more of a... I've always thought that it's also it's an agenda that look I mean I'm an architect we rely on new housing being built but it's it's an agenda that I think suits a lot of people and it does you know the 
the property development industry supports and construction supports like a huge amount of jobs in the UK. So it's expedient for everybody to say there's a housing shortage and we need to build homes. There's not. There's an, there's an affordability crisis, not a housing crisis. And they're sort of different things. But like we're bludgeoning this affordability crisis with yeah. with a, with a hammer of house building and hoping that it works and look it will have some effects if you build enough housing you create less demand so therefore you you know there's more supply less demand you bring down prices it works on paper but I, I actually think that the you know these macroeconomic things that you're talking about aren't going to be solved by just purely building more housing that won't allow more people necessarily to get on the housing ladder and it is just I think an expedient catch-all phrase you know housing crisis let's yeah. build more homes it sort of works for a lot of people's agendas because it stimulates economic growth. And I think it's a political decision to make to, to correlate the two instead of sort of yeah. separating affordability and, and housing supply. Yeah, I think it's also very difficult politically to change. So basically, if you really wanted to try and improve the allocation of homes and basically make it easier for people to move more often and incentivize them to move to like the housing that they need rather than they just happen to have and stay in, then you'd want to switch from like stamp duty a tax on transactions to basically a well a, a wealth tax that kind of gets the same revenue and it's just that it doesn't need to be necessarily massive but it's that little that kind those kind of nudges that can really change people's behavior and i think it's you know and if, if you were to do that of course you also need you you do need the right kind of housing so if you're going to have people moving out of the sort of family home you need somewhere that's attractive for them to downsize to and maybe that maybe that's I don't know if that's really provided for at the moment. So, yeah. And I, I guess going back to the political point, I guess, you know, even Michael Gove the other day in a, in a column was suggesting that some kind of a nimble wealth tax could be could be something he'd think about. And, you know, so I think Labour would be more, think about that a bit more. So may, maybe that could be something we see come onto the agenda. Interesting. Michael Gove says things without thinking them through and their impact on the housing sector is fundamental. His, his statement recently about staircases being one of those examples. So on the on the subject of nudges, I want to finish by asking, Andrew, you're in, you're promoted to Bank of England government, governor or somebody in the government capable of changing the policy. What three things do you do to stimulate economic growth and also property sector growth? What, what are the little, little like as you know, as your example of a wealth tax over a stamp duty tax promoting more transactions, what other three nudges would you do to change things for the better? <laughs> Another three. I, I was hoping I could have that as at least one. I oh, know, sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess that would be my that would be my main one. It's a it's a hard question. I suppose from a Bank of Bank of England governor perspective, I would, you know, I think the risk there is that they've that we, as we were saying earlier, that it's taking longer for these interest rate increases to take effect. So I think if I was on the part of the Bank of England, I'd be keen to maybe not raise interest rates again, and be particularly wary of signs that the economy is weakening, and you know just be be quick. I'd be more dovish, I think, because yeah, as we we're saying that, and that that would help obviously that the property market recover sooner and basically just but make, would you stimulate make would, you, would you put more money into the economy i mean like you know we're still i think a lot of this inflation is because we've had years of quantitative easing and help to buy and like all of these things that yeah just pump fake money around and had this effect of just inflating everything would, would you do that would you be skeptical of doing that further yeah i think it's it, yes it's a lot harder to, to to justify that to that and now when you when inflation is a real problem so yeah you, it means you've got to be well, certainly, if you're going to do those things, you need to make sure that you take money out of the economy elsewhere. So you can still use fiscal policy as a tool to kind of get desired outcomes. And, you know, help to buy, for instance, isn't necessarily a terrible policy for raising house building, in my view. Sure, it raises house builder profits a bit and new new house prices, but it did definitely raise the number of new homes being built by 15 to 20 percent as well. So I wouldn't necessarily. I don't know. Look, I mean, we're in the hangover of it now. And so, you know, it's one of those things that once you stop it, as, as any good, you know, hangovers, like the negative effect afterwards, the bounce back from from that high is a, is a low living through that now. But also you've got house builders that are sitting on a ton of profits that they're not choosing to reinvest at the moment, which they made from those policies. And I think all of it, all of it did was push the bottom end of the market up. So, you know, it, it, when we're talking about affordability rather than supply and demand affordability became worse because of help to buy because it just pushed the bottom of the market up and uh, you know nobody yeah. 
everybody was pricing things just around that bottom of the you know it was 450,000 in London I think and all of the every every single flat was kind of around there and it would have been lower before but it was artificially pushed up right to the top and but now you know they're kind of like nothing selling but nobody really wants to put the prices back down against crystallized losses on the basis yeah of, I, I think sell for a certain rate yeah I think it's it feels like a pretty terrible time to to end it and I guess the other thing on from the government's point of view is that they they may they you know they're sitting on quite a healthy profit from the equity loans that they they did issue so I think maybe it's the timing of it more than anything you know it's mm. it's the times like these when you probably want to introduce something like that but unfortunately it, they've done exactly the opposite I suppose final point and I think I you know please promote capital economics I think the round table that I went to was fascinating and I know that you know talk a bit talk a little bit about who who are your clients who you're looking to work with and how they can get in touch with you please Absolutely. So I guess across the whole company, a lot of our clients are asset managers and sort of traders or hedge funds. But um, it, in property in particular, we've got yeah both sort of investors, lenders and developers. So I think we cater for the whole kind of the whole kind of swathe of, of people in the in the property market. And as, as we're sort of alluding to, I think in general, we're pretty good at forecasting the next three years and particularly the next year or two so before uh, other people cotton on because of the kind of the 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 breadth of economic research we have in house and the conversations we're constantly having and i think ultimately you know in terms of the property cycle that's that's really what it's driven by and the great thing about property is it tends to lag so if you're forecasting it you can um you can look quite good at times so uh, yeah i definitely recommend anyone the, the core product is our is our written research but as you're saying we we, we do have a lot of um online and in-person events that we we, we enjoy you know talking to our clients face to face and hearing what their priorities are as well. And that often feeds back into what we're, we're, we're looking at in our research. So yeah, definitely something to look at if you haven't, haven't seen it before. And how do people find you? Do they go on your LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook? How, how should people get in contact with you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can say so LinkedIn is a good one. Just Andrew Wishart on LinkedIn should pop up. Also just Googling Andrew Wishart housing will take you to the capital economics website. And I think uh, my email address is on there as well. So yeah, feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much for your time. It's amazing. Thanks. If you enjoyed the show, then please subscribe and give us a review, ideally a five-star one. And uh, if you want to know more, please go to acroidlowry.com or follow us on Twitter at acroidlowry and Instagram with the same. This podcast supports LandAid, the property industry charity that brings together the sector to deliver life-changing projects for young people who really need it. Visit www.landaid.org to find out how you can help end youth homelessness. <laughs>